So, it's a great pleasure and uh, privilege to have a chance to talk to Barry Caverne, who I've known for some years in King's. Um, Barry, when and where were you born? I was born in 1942 in a very small village in New Yorkshire called Warmsworth, which is, uh, nearest town is Doncaster. It was a tiny village, uh, and it was right in the middle of the coal mining area. Uh, the, you know, Edlington, Edlington, Maine, Cadeby Colliery, Maltby Colliery, all around that little village there were collieries. In fact, the, the only industry for that area was coal mining. Mm. So were your parents coal miners? No, my mother wasn't, <laughs> but my father was. And my, I mean, I was the first male in my family not to go down coal mines. Really? Gosh. Yeah. They, for how many generations? Oh, for four generations. And, uh, yeah, and uh, thank goodness I didn't. Mm. And, and my, uh, my father, I, actually, he got trapped in the mine with a fall and did himself an injury and then stopped mining and used the money to buy himself a small business. And uh, the business sort of went well. Uh, and he moved into a bigger business and so it went on. So he what kind of business? Into a tell business. Hmm. What a small hotel. Hmm. Uh, well, he first of all started off with a golf club where he got his training and then he went into getting the hotel. But uh, I was, I mean, the, the story I'm recollecting now is what was recalled to me rather than basically remembering it because I, although I was, uh, I was born in 42, my father was at, at, at war and my grandfather had died and my great-grandfather had died. And so I was brought up in a house full of women, hmm. and I was absolutely spoilt rotten so time. <laughs> I had th three women all competing for my attention. And, uh, Mother, was, grandmother, and who was the other? Great-grandmother. Oh. Mm. Do you remember anything about your great-grandmother? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, Tell me about Very, her. very close to her. She was a, a really grand old matriline who everybody, even the sons, my uncles, and were, were sort of listened to and didn't, didn't dare contradict or say anything that would uh, upset her. But she was, because I, I couldn't do anything wrong, she was extremely generous and helpful to me. And, uh, and uh, I, I guess I, according to my mother, she, she brought me through life in that I was born prematurely. I had only weighed just over four pounds, which during the war, there were no incubators or anything. Mm. The, the nurses told my grandmother, not my mother, that I wouldn't stand a chance of surviving. My, but my mother, my grandmother brought me through mm. by feeding me little drips of sugar and water mm. because I couldn't suckle very well. So, mm. so that's truly amazing. Mm. And uh, um, I, I, I can still remember my, co the, my great grandmother's co-op number. I can't remember <laughs> telephone numbers, but I remember that number because I used to go, I used to go and do her groceries for her. even. After we'd left there and my parents got a house and we lived away, I used to go back there on weekends and I always used to go and do a shopping for her <laughs> and uh, go to the court and, and buy things there. Hmm. So I went to a junior school which had two classes for the whole junior school, so you're mixed with different years. And uh, it was an old stone junior school with the no lavatories, just a hole in the sort of in the field, mm. if you were at the bottom of the playground. Mm. And uh, I also remember having to queue up every morning to get a spoonful of cod liver oil and a spoonful to follow it of orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> Strange <laughs> tasting yeah, orange juice. Yeah, yeah they were, but they were, I mean, I don't, I, I kind of, I didn't have any sort of traumas in my childhood at all. Everything just seemed to mm. go sailing along. I was, I was forever happy. I can't think of any, mm. any real unhappiness I had. It was a bit tough for me when my father came back from the war mm. uh, because, because you know, I'd been spoiled rotten mm. and he started being more of a sort of disciplinarian, so that took some getting used to. But apart, but apart from that, everything went fine. Um, what sort of character were your parents and as people? Th they, were, they were working class, very pleased to have made it mm. into uh, being independent, mm. uh, but that was by the time I went to university. Mm. I mean, up until that time, they were not independent, and 
so they, uh, uh, they, 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 they were allowed to. Loving and encouraging and... Um, well, yes, they were loving, but it was not open. Mm. There was this, this, this uh, Yorkshire way and male chauvinist way of not showing emotions. Mm. Mm -hmm. And my mother almost felt a little bit kind of uh, ashamed when she was openly emotional. Didn't, mm. didn't, didn't like people to see that. Whereas my great-grandmother was mm. always open and, mm. uh, and loving and kind and cuddling and things. Mm. So, so there was, uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that, that I, I had a lot of love and physical attention, mm. although I knew that they were always there and always cared about me and I could ask for whatever I wanted and, you know, they would be, be helpful in that way. But mm. I was kind of left to, to, to grow up in my own way, as it were. You have brothers because and both sisters. Both parents or were not? working. I had a younger brother. Yeah. Both parents were working, and he went into the family business. Mm. Uh, and I'd come home from school in the evening and, and let myself in and get myself something to eat. And I became fairly able to look after myself, really. Mm. From a young, that was even at junior school, from a young age. I mean, in those days, you, you could do that. You'd mm. Now, parents would be locked up. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in those days, it was, yeah, it was quite common. Were you as, I mean, on the edge of beautiful country, even if it's mainly coal mines? It did was, you run, roam around? And I did, yeah. There was a, a lot of countryside. Mm. Uh, I mean, the river was the River Don, which was terribly polluted. Mm. I always used to think it looked nice because it had all this foam on top of it by the <laughs> waterfall. <laughs> and I learned later in life that I realised it was through pollution. Mm. Um, but uh, I used to, to walk a lot around mm. there. And, and did you have hobbies like collecting? Anything or studying anything? In, in, in those early days, I, uh, this, I'm talking now when, mm. was when I was at junior school. Yep. I, I was just a stamp collector. Mm. That was the only thing I kept. I mm. still got that stamp collection somewhere, mm. but that was the only thing really mm. I, uh, I did. Oh, I was interested in sport as well. I was interested in, um, in sprinting, running. Mm. Mm. Did, were there any teachers at that junior school who? Affected you in any way? Not, not particularly, no. Mm. I mean, the classes were huge. The classes were uh, between 50 and 60 kids mm. in a class, mm. and it was uh, it was massive. And I, I did my 11 plus there, mm. and I think there were, there were out of all of the, the two classes that took the examination, there were only nine, I think it was, who went to grand school. And you were one of them? And I was one of them. I passed my 11 plus and went to grand school. Mm. And then uh, at grammar school... Which grammar school was uh, Well, I actually passed for Doncaster Grammar School because mm. the junior school I went to was in the borough. But then uh, I was told that because we lived out of the borough, because this village, Wormsworth, was just on the periphery out of the borough, they said I couldn't go to the grammar school. So I, uh, I went to Mexborough Grammar School, which was uh, West Riding of Yorkshire. Mm. So it was all part of West Riding. And, uh, but I wasn't allowed to go to the town mm. uh, Doncaster grammar school. And that was a massive grammar school, co-ed, uh, over a thousand students, five streams in each year. And in Gosh. those days, we were streamed. Mm. You, know, you went into, you know, not only did you do your 11 plus, but you were then subsequently streamed to get mm. into whatever stream uh, was, was appropriate. And I, I got into the top stream. Mm. Uh, but I never ever came uh, first in the class. Mm. It was always girls who came first, <laughs> second. The highest I ever came was third. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, again, I sailed through school without any problems. I got the cane twice. Once for whistling in the corridor, <laughs> and once for eating in the street. So although it was a state, traditional grammar school, they maintained very strict discipline. Mm. And uh, I mean, I never, I never thought anything of it, getting, mm. getting the care. I mean, it was quite a, quite a good thing to have done in a way, because otherwise, you know, you you got you got uh, brownie points with every with all of the other lads in the school. Mm. You, got, mm. you got accepted as being normal, as it were. Mm. Um, I mean, I didn't go out of the way to get in. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, uh, uh, discipline was tight, mm. without question or doubt. Mm. I mean, not usually caning. It was usually. Mm. And I, 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 I very seldom got detention because I was quite conscientious about mm. my work. Were there any teachers there who 
Yes, the, yes, there were. There were teachers there that I like I like very much. I can't remember the names now, but but the biology teacher in particular I thought was wonderful. Mm. He really he really made things interesting and stimulating. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I guess um, chemistry was pretty dull, I have to say. <laughs> and <laughs> but we all had to do it, and physics. Um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I. Did the biology did teacher work. sort of take you out on expeditions? Yes, she did. Yes, we went on, on to field courses and things like that. Mm. And that was uh, that was quite that was again quite eye opening. Mm. And, uh, I enjoy that very much. Um, I also, at secondary school, played chess. Okay. That was became one of my hobbies. Mm. And I, I played for the school, and I then played for the uh, for the county. Uh, and then when I went to university, I played, played for the university. Mm. But uh, I played with 69 other 70 70 boards. We played one of the Russian Grand Masters, and. Uh, I lost, but nobody beat him. <laughs> and I suddenly realised that, gosh, I thought I was good at chess, but I'm not. I'm a million miles from being good at chess. You know how you kind of sail through and everything you do, the standards that you come up against, you're high, and the standards you come up against are high, then suddenly you meet somebody who is really <laughs> first class, and you suddenly realise, oh, you know, this is... And so I stopped playing, actually. Oh. I gave up. No. Well, not entirely gave up, but I stopped playing, as it were, seriously, because mm. I realised there was nothing I could do to become that good. Mm. Not that, I mean, when I say nothing I could do, I wasn't prepared to mm. sacrifice absolutely everything, every mm. minute of every day, mm. to play te chess. Mm. I played chess because I enjoyed playing it, and, uh, uh, and I enjoyed winning it as well. <laughs> but I, there, was, there was no chance that I could put the amount of time and effort into the comeback. Mm. What about other games? You mentioned sprinting. Were you still running? or? Uh, I did, uh, not particularly. Uh, what I took up, this is now when I went to university, what I took up was, was mountaineering and climbing. Mm. And I used to go quite often down to, well, ev often down to Harrison's Rocks in Tunbridge Wells, which is just south of London, and to uh, Lamberis Pass up in Wales, up to the Lake District, up to, to uh, the Cornwall, Zena Cove, the rocks down there. So I'm pretty well all over the country, and in Scotland, uh, climbing. Um, we used to go up to Scotland every winter um, and go mountaineering, that was, rather than rock climbing. So it's pretty walking and mountaineering up mm -hmm. in um, uh, the Larry Groove, up in the, uh, uh, the highlands of Scotland. That was absolutely terrific. One year, one year we rescued the SAS. <laughs> they, they, they had been put out on a mission, these four guys, dressed in civilian clothes. And it can be bitterly cold. Mm. It's I came with mm. the, I remember the eggs froze solid. And uh, these two guys came to our tent and said, because we were out in the middle of nowhere, and you know, there's no civilization for, in fact, it's the most, the most distant place you can be from any civilization in the British Isles. And um, these guys came and said, we've got problems. Two of our men are uh, collapsed, and uh, they're in serious need of, of rescue. And uh, so we let them have one of our tents, we had two tents, they had one of our tents and sleeping bags. And um, they wrote to us afterwards and sent us a new tent. Well, no, they, re they reconditioned the tent, that's <laughs> right. They reconditioned the tent and sent us mm. our things back. And they were very grateful, and the guys survived. But they didn't tell us very much about it, except that they were on a mission. Mm. And that we later realized they were special services. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they were adventurous days, and I enjoyed that. And after university, I took a year out and went to um, Africa to the mountains of the moon initially, mm. to do mountaineering there, and to do a um, biological project mm. that we set up to get, and it was a university expedition, so we got funding from various places to, to help pay us for this. And um, I went out on a boat in a supernumerary crew, sailed all the way down the Suez Canal, 
Yes. Mountains of the Moon are in Kenya. Uh, Ke Kenya or Zori. Yeah. Mm. Right. Out on the border. In fact, when we got there, uh, we were told not to go up there because there was a war going on in the Congo, and there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, guerrilla forces coming up into the Ruenzoris, and they said uh, they they would probably shoot us just to get the food and any supplies we had with us. Um, because, you know, and they showed us some horrific pictures of people who had been massacred in the ruins always by these, uh, I'm trying to remember what they were called now, there was, they, were, they were Congolese, uh, I've forgotten the names, but, but anyway, they, uh, uh, they had sort of fled the war zones and were camping in the foothills of the ruins always on the Congo side. And um, which, sorry, I beg your pardon. The Congo is the Urenzor is uh, in Uganda, not Kenya. Mm. Uganda mm. and uh, the Congo up mm. on that that roof there. I mean, beautiful mountains. So we we transferred our project to Mount Kenya mm. because it has the same kind of Afro, what they call Afro Alpine zone, mm. like you get in the Urenzor, where you get the different, you know, you get the rainforest and then you get the bamboo zone and then you get the Yabawaki forest and then the then the grass tussocks, and then you're up on the snow line. And so uh, we transferred to, to Mount Kenya mm. and spent, uh, I think it was eight or nine months up Mount Kenya. Uh, ran out of food in the end, apart from peas. So we were just living <laughs> off peas virtually for two weeks before the porters arrived the next time. Because the porters came up periodically mm. to bring, bring our, our food supplies, but they were not very punctual when okay, they really suited them to come, sort of thing. So we uh, we had a in fact, we had a great time there. There were four of us there, and we've remained very close friends ever since. Mm. We bonded and very much were in each other's hands in terms of survival. Mm. So we were living at what fourteen and a half thousand feet for six mm. months, um, and we did some climbing because that's really what we were into, as well as doing the biology. Um, and the biology was was asking questions about the, the, the fauna, but also about the flora, because you get extremely high fluctuations in day-night temperature. I mean, going to as, as little, as low as minus 20, and going up into the you know, 70s in the sun, because uh, it's right on the equator, in that case. And um, uh, we were interested in how how any flora could possibly survive, and b why the plants there grew to such gigantic size because they you had the senecios and lobelias which grew up taller than a man, huge, huge, great size. And uh, what what we found was that um, although we put the misters in the plants at different this, this is the first time I've talked about this for 40 years. I'm just remembering <laughs> it, recalling it now. We put the misters in the plants and found, in fact, that what happens at night is, is the leaves close up. And so the temperature, the core temperature, doesn't go below zero. But what happens is it's a continual dying process uh, so that the, the, the plants get bigger because the leaves die and, as it were, coat, coat the, 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 the stems and allow it to survive. Uh, and uh, then during the daytime it's all metabolic process and growth. At night the growth slows down and, and death occurs of parts of the plant which protects the rest of the plant. So it was, it was, it was, it was quite, it got me interested in, in biology and the sense of doing things and thinking about things for the first time. Mm. Mm. Well, that, this path we've taken has been along mountains and mountain climbing um, and really the point of departure was your school. Um, so if we can go back just right. to finish off in the school, a couple of things. One is, um, were there any other sort of extramural activities, um, student politics, drama, music, um, that was you were beginning to get interested in? Well, I, in? I, 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 I'm not, I wasn't hugely interested, uh, but you know, I was in the school play, and I was, what, uh, 
Oh, I played a violin. Yes, mm. I did. I played a violin. I, I gave up. I've forgotten I gave up playing that. In <laughs> fact, I, I was the... I played the violin at junior school, and I gave a solo, com, uh, solo concert there. Well, it was not a concert, but you know, they call mm. it a solo, to the, to the town, in, mm. in, the, in the town hall, uh, when, uh, at the age of 10, I think it was. Mm. And, uh, and my music master thought I was destined to become a famous musician, but... When I went to grammar school, I have to confess, I didn't tell them that I played the music history. <laughs> <laughs> because, again, it was something that, to be good, you had to put a lot of time mm. into it. Mm. And so I, uh, I, 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 was, I was very much into um, trying to be male, as it were, mm. and do male-like things mm. rather than do things that... Uh, that uh, uh, I particularly uh, wanted to, to uh, excel at. Mm. Where, but did you maintain an interest in music? I mean, do you listen oh, yeah, to music? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you listen to it a lot? Yes, I do. And what, yeah. what kind of music do you like? Well, my, uh, my favourite music is, uh, I, as I get older, I think, I think it's very much Bach. Mm. Bach? Yeah. Mm. But I also... I mean, I like the old Gregorian chant. Uh, I like the uh, uh, Mahler, um, and uh, a, a whole range of, of, uh, of musicians, both old and, and relatively new. Mm. Um, sorry, composers, not musicians, mm. composers. But I, I haven't. It's 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 something I do mm. to relax to. Mm. Rather than do out of an intellectual pursuit, mm. which uh, which I did much more so. It was much more intellectual in terms of getting to know all of the different composers and different mm. types of music when I was at university. Mm. Then I spent a lot of time mm. uh, listening to music and getting to know music. The, does the relaxation help your work? I mean, do you listen to music to, to let your mind? calm down from work or as an inspiration to work? Is it related in any way to No, it? not as an inspiration. I just just do it to, to relax, just mm. to sit and quiet, as mm. a quiet time. Yeah. The other, the other um, thing that often happens at around that age, i.e. 15, 16, is either a movement towards or away from formal religion. Um, it's a time that some people are confirmed. I don't know what your parents... No, I was, I was never confirmed. Um, uh, my parents weren't overtly religious. Mm. They, uh, I mean, if you ask them if they believed in God, yes, they did. And they, uh, they went to, um, you know, sort of births, marriages and funerals, really. Mm. They went. So mm. I wasn't brought up in any religious way. I think... I mean, I, I found out, oh, after my mother had died, in fact, that uh, her father, my grandfather on my mother's mm. side, this is the other grandmothers mm. I was talking about, mm. I never knew her because she died uh, uh, very early when I was about one or two years old. Mm. But on, on that side of the family, um, my father, my, my mother's father, my grandfather on that side, who did live to a ripe old age into his 90s and was a First World War hero, he fell out with his father, who was a rabbi. Hmm. And, and he, married a, he married somebody who was not Jewish. His wife was not Jewish. And more to the point, he, he, went, he signed up to go to war. This is in the First World War, hmm. without his um, uh, father agreeing to. And so he was, he was literally cast out of the family mm. from his brothers and father, and they just wouldn't talk to him. And so, um, so I, I guess my mother wasn't brought up in any religious way mm. for that reason, uh, and uh, nor was I, mm. or my brother. Mm. And what has your religious um, development been? I mean talking to a number of people, it seems that the physicists are a fairly mystical bunch, whereas the biologists tend to be of the Dawkins persuasion. 
Well, I'm certainly not of the Dawkins persuasion, because I think he's just as evangelical as the evangelicals. I, 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 believe, I believe in beliefs. Hmm. I believe that beliefs are enormously important. Uh, we all need them. They're crucially important. And I would be the last person to want to deny anyone something that they believed in that gave them a sense of comfort or well-being, that, uh, a sense of uh, peace with themselves, if you like. Um, so, uh, uh, but I myself believe that my beliefs are very much in... Uh, humanity and the future of mankind and uh, trying to ensure that we keep our environment as uh, habitable and ecologically normal as possible. Mm. I mean, so, so I do, I do believe that things, there are important things, in, but for me the important things are the here and now ones rather than what might happen at some future time if there is such a future time. Mm. So Dawkins' his argument that Darwin has disproved religion, what do you think is? Well, I think, I don't think that Darwin has disproved religion, um, uh, because Darwin himself, I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was a religious man, and then he, I think it was more the death of his daughter, wasn't it, that, that, mm. that kind of made him disaffected. Mm. Uh, and his wife still remained very religious, and they were together. So I, I think that I think that if he had been anti-religion, really anti-religion, he, he would never have got on with his his wife and, and family. Mm -hmm. And so I think that he he too was was tolerant of religions, mm -hmm. even though he himself latterly I, I guess he didn't believe, although I've, I've no evidence for that. But um, I mean I don't I certainly don't. Believe I do believe in evolution firmly and profoundly, um, and I believe it's infinitely more complex than uh, we might imagine it has been. But nevertheless, I, I'm absolutely committed to it and very interested in it. In fact, in this last few years, um, most of my thinking time has been thinking about evolution and uh, how things have come about and how. In particular, one of the things that particularly interests me at that level is the um, since humans are are continually evolutionary continuum with animals, what makes us so much different? Mm. And it's that what makes us. What are the evolutionary steps that have made us that little bit different? Mm. To, don't get me wrong. Depending on what kind of level you want to look, mm. you know, cellular, molecular, genetic. You know, we are remarkably incredibly similar to all other living creatures, but at the level of brain evolution, we are really something quite special. Mm -hmm. And of course, my interests are in brain and behavior, mm -hmm. and therefore, a great deal of interest is, uh, I have, so far as how the brain, our brain came to be what it is, and how it makes us different from other animals, whilst at the same time being remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very fascinating area, which perhaps we'll come back to. Sure, and we discuss. I'd be delighted to come back. <laughs> um, but just coming back to to your progress through education, um, yeah. you'd obviously got into a science stream, and, and they were yes. subjects which interested Six, you. Sixth form of science stream. Yeah. Yeah. And although, believe it or not, in in the lower school, I was in what they call the art stream. <laughs> I'd been streamed. As, so then, when I went into the science stream. I had to take my O level and A level chemistry in mm. two years mm. because I hadn't done chemistry. Mm. So. Uh, and you found it fairly dull, did you? I did, yeah. yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. Mm, you Got did it. it. And, th and then was it obvious that you would try for university at the end of. Yes, it was. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the school was, was bent on mm. that happening. Mm. Although, again, I was the first person in my family to go to university. First, the first, uh, I have cousins who have also gone. Mm. Uh, who, uh, uh, let me think. No, uh, they were younger than me. Mm. Yeah, only one. Uh, there was another a cousin who was a year younger than me, and other cousins ever since. So, mm. Mm. 
And where did you go? I went to London University. Mm. Which part? So it was to it was called Queen Elizabeth College, but it was part of King's College and is part of King's College mm. now. Mm. I'm, a, I'm King's alumni, if mm. you like, King's mm. London letters. Mm. And how was that? Did you enjoy it? I did. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It was a real eye-opener, being in London and being independent and away from home. And uh, uh, I, it, I have to say, I didn't put as much time and effort into my academic work as I did into, into my social life and being on societies and chairing societies and various things in the, in the university and the college. And I had a terrific time. I really enjoyed it. This was 1961, wasn't it? This, this would be 61 to 64, yeah. yeah. And, then, um, and then I took a year out mm. um, to go to Africa. Mm. Then I, mm. I, when I came back, I decided, having taken that year out, that really the thing I was interested in was doing research. I, I, I couldn't uh, face up to doing a, a, any kind of routine job. Mm. I knew I'd never survive. I felt I just had to do something which I would find interesting. What did you read at um, university? What, what was the subject? Physiology. Physiology. Yeah. yeah. No, were there any notable teachers? Huxley wasn't there. Uh, uh, he, he taught a bit in London at one point. Uh, do you, um, I, I, I certainly wasn't taught. By him. Mm. Actually, the, the person that I admired in those days was J.Z. Young. I used mm. to go and listen to J.Z. Young's mm. lectures. I thought he was a wonderful, wonderful biologist. Mm. He had a, a, an enormous knowledge and grasp of biology. Mm. And he was, he was also very, he had a very evolutionary approach, mm. which I think was what kind of stimulated me to think more about evolution. Mm. Um, uh, I I, I, because I was interested in, in, in brain and behavior, I did a, a, my PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry. Did you? Mm. Tavistock, is that one? Uh, no, it's not. It's absolutely the opposite of Tavistock. Oh, Ta yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tavistock is very much um, Freudian oh, yes. and analytical, mm. whereas the Maudsley Institute oh, yes. of Psychiatry is very much biological. Mm. Mm. And uh, I did my my PhD there, and it did, um, did very well out of it in a postdoc. What, what was the subject of the thesis? I, I, was in, I was interested in the way in which hormones influence behaviour, mm. and they had a very powerful effect on behaviour in rodents and, and small brain mammals, but nobody had really looked to see if they had any impact on behaviour in large brain mammals. I worked with monkeys, mm. and uh, I was very interested uh, in um, in what motivated females in terms of their sexual activity with respect to their cycle. Um, the problem was that the, that the work done in the field was very incomplete in those days, and any work done in the lab had just said, well, monkeys mate at all times sort of thing. But what I did is I set up a, a system whereby, because the male is so much bigger than the female, the male tend to dominate the relationship, and especially if you're looking at them in captivity, in, even though it's a very large cage, nevertheless, the males are much bigger, and if they want to mate, they will go and mate. So I gave the female, I emancipated the female <laughs> from the male's influence by having a partition across the cage with the door, that moved, if the female pressed the lever quite rigorously, she was on a, uh, I mean, I got it up to a, fi a fixed ratio schedule of 500 to 1, so she had to press that lever 500 times to open the door. Gosh. And she would do that within two or three minutes, actually. Very, very fast. She would rattle away, and that would open the door. And the door was too small for the male to get through, so the female could go through. And then there was a lever on the other side she wanted to press, she could come out. And the outcome of that was actually the female pressed that lever to get with the male on every day of the cycle. All the females did. But what was interesting is sometimes, that, and, and, and the times when it was, um, 
they were more, female was more interested in the male, was at mid cycle around the time, about the time she ovulated. So then she would press very hard for the male to get to the female. The other thing, sorry, she would press very hard for her to get to yeah. the male. The other thing that interested me was the male was interested in the female. Uh, and it, uh, it, it, all of the evidence suggested that the things that interested males about females was the, uh, uh, the sex skin colour, the, the bright colours that they have on their backside mm. as a sexual signal. But in fact, uh, I found that had that had no impact whatsoever. You could artificially make that the bright colour because mm. it's due to a vasodilation. Mm. And if you just put a, 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 an oestrogen cream on there, then you've got a bright red. Um, and with in low concentration, so it doesn't affect the brain. Mm. And uh, the males uh, were not interested in that. Mm. But what the males were interested in, their interest was in the smell of the female, olfaction. Mm. Mm. The males were interested in the female, in the female's pheromones. Mm. So I did the converse of the female experiment. I gave the males an opportunity to press mm. access to the female. But I, I, I. Uh, what I used was females that were, were over ectomized and unreceptive to males, but I just changed their attractiveness by changing their odor. And males would press for the, uh, in inverted commas, attractive females, mm. the ones that smelled right to mm. them. But, um, but that's kind of breaking things down at a mechanistic level of A, looking at the hormones and how they're impacting on the brain for behavior, looking at the hormones and how they're impacting in the periphery uh, on behavior. And, and generally speaking, hormones are synchronizing both things together throughout most of biology, really. Mm. Um, I'll come on to that mm. later if I get to talk about pregnancy. But uh, the, the, what I realized after doing this, I then started to look at what happens when you do this in a social group. So if you now put, make a female attractive with pheromones, putting artificial, because we did the, the analysis, the chemical analysis, and pulled out the important ingredients and could make up these artificial odors and put them on females. But if we did it in a social group, it had no impact whatsoever. So it became clear that the, the I mean, you could get it to have an impact, but it, it would not, I mean, males were interested in, in the, the dominant. Uh, or any females at all if they were a dominant male. And so I then went to look at the way in which social hierarchy has an impact on behaviour. And, and what I found was again it became inverted in that an animal's status was much more important for the behaviour than, than the hormones. You know, you, you, could, you could castrate a male, so, and he would still continue to be interested in females for a long time and he'll still be high-ranking for a long time. The converse of that was if a male lost rank through social interactions, social reasons, sexual behaviour stopped immediately and never started up again. Mm. And, um, and, and also, it had a very... So status was correlated, rank was correlated with male hormone levels, with testosterone. But if you... Uh, if a male lost rank, the testosterone would go down. But a low-ranking male, you could give them testosterone up to their ears, <laughs> and it had no impact on their behaviour. It didn't affect their rank. They didn't become go up the hierarchy. It didn't affect their behaviour with the females. So suddenly, I be, after after spending four years, five years, working on uh, our hormones have an impact on behaviour. I suddenly realized that you've got to get these things into context, that context being the situation, the social situation in which the animal normally lives. Hmm. So I, I suddenly realized that, that, that social hierarchies were very much more important. But social hierarchies not only affected the male, I also found that they, they could affect the female too. And they could affect the female in the sense that low-ranking females uh, were less likely to ovulate. They became, uh, they became uh, anovulatory. They, mm. they, they didn't show an LH surge. And they didn't show an LH surge, surge even by uh, challenging 
a brain which controls the ovulation, even by challenging the brain with the appropriate hormones which normally uh, bring it about, they, they simply wouldn't have a response mm. in the, the downstream organs. And, uh, they, so you, you had a social, uh, social suppression of reproduction mm. in low-ranking individuals. Very interesting. Mm. Who, who was supervising this? That, uh, that, that work was supervised uh, uh, originally in London with the opera work, that is the mm. evil person in the nose, that was with a, a Richard Michael. What happened was I was offered a job, in the, there, were, there were two or three people in the States who were interested in the work mm. I was doing in opera mm. positions, and uh, I applied for a, a fellowship, an American fellowship, and I didn't get it. So, okay, I didn't get it. And uh, so I, I, this Richard Michael allowed me to continue. Not allowed me, wanted me to come because I was doing very good work. I mean, I think in that, that I think I had something like uh, six or seven papers in nature and science over the course of three years, hmm. which was pretty good going. I mean, plus other papers as well in lesser journals. I can't remember which they were. Anyway, going, we're going back to the uh, uh, late sixties, early seventies here. Hmm. Anyway. About a year after that not getting there, Richard Michael said, invited me to go to the States. He says, I'm moving to the States and I want to take you mm. over with me. I've got a position, you have a senior postdoc position, tenure post and, and uh, you know, senior postdoc with tenure mm. track. And uh, do you know, do come along, I'll give you every opportunity. Well, I I actually wanted at this stage, I mean I wanted to make a move. Because I thought, you know, I've been in this environment and I didn't like his attitude. Mm. Uh, uh, although he was, I have to say, uh, at that time, I mean, he, he was very, very helpful and positive to me. Actually, one of his former students, Joe Herbert, oh, yes. who, who was here in Cambridge, yep. and uh, I came up to see Joe, who because you're in a difficult position when you've had this kind of relationship with somebody who you felt was no fault of your own um, and all you'd done was worked hard and produced well and suddenly been let down very badly. But there was not much you could do about it. Mm. So I came to see Joe to talk to him about it and see what he, because he knew, because he'd done his PhD mm. with Richard Michael as well. And he was very sympathetic. You know, I do understand. Why don't you come here to Cambridge? Because he, he started in Cambridge. And I said, well, that would be very nice. And so I, 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 I brought my money mm. with me to Cambridge for a year. And then I got a, a fellowship, not a college fellowship. I got, a, I think it was a Foundations Fund for Research and Psychiatry fellowship. Uh, and then I got uh, a lectureship within, uh, I think it was two years or three, mm. two, two or three years. I can't remember exactly but relatively short period of time. In the department of? In the department. Of zoology or? Uh, no, this was anatomy. Anatomy. Mm. Oh, right. So I then had to learn anatomy. <laughs> I had to learn how to dissect the whole body and, and instruct. And I, I must say, I learned a lot about the brain, mm. a huge amount, because teaching medics and teaching medics in those days, they had a full year on the brain. Mm. And, you know, I know the brain inside out and backwards and upside down and, you know, <laughs> If you get a bullet hole here, I can tell you exactly <laughs> the structures it's gone through, what the problems will be. So, so I, it, it was, it was an important, it was a complete new discipline. Mm. But I, I don't mind. I love being on a learning curve. Mm. I spend my whole life. I'm still on a learning curve. Mm. Learning. I mean, I just love learning new things. Mm. So I, I had no problems with mm. doing DR work and, and teaching and supervising. And mm. uh, uh, I didn't actually supervise the uh, upper limb and the lower limb because I found them so pretty dull to supervise. There's nothing, there's nothing intellectually challenging about them. But the brain is challenging. Knowing and understanding the brain is, is very challenging. And I, I also think that you, you, you can't look at the brain in isolation. You need to know how the brain fits in with the body, as it were and how it responds to the bodily needs as well as tells the body what to do. So I, uh, 
I, I enjoy learning my anatomy and getting knowledge of anatomy. Hmm. Did no one think it rather odd that someone who knew no anatomy was now a lecturer in anatomy? I got, I got in my lectureship purely on the basis of my publications hmm. and, you know, the... Uh, uh, how good I was, I guess, how good I looked on paper at any mm. rate. But, but you're right, except the professor of anatomy was Richard Harris, Richard, was it Richard Harrison, mm. who, was, uh, who was really a zoologist. Mm. Well, he, he was a medic, but he was really a zoologist, and he mm. was interested in cetacea, mm. he was interested in, uh, in dolphins, mm. and uh, he, uh, he, he said, was his attitude, <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> so I did, and I uh, and I, I taught. I mean, I actually gave lectures. I gave lectures on the sympathetic nervous system. I gave lectures on the breast. I gave lectures on. I, I gave quite a lot of lectures on the brain, but I also gave lectures on topographical anatomy. My mm. scenes. Um, when did you come to Cambridge? What year was this? About I think it was 70, 72. Mm. Mm. and. Um, and also, Richard Harrison was, was very kind of benign. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the second in command was Max Ball, who was an absolutely died in the wool anatomist. Max? Max Ball. Mm -hmm. And he was, at, he was at Queen's College, and he, he, well, he was a tough. And he said, uh, if you're going to teach anatomy, you're going to have to uh, get some teaching experience. And I've got an ideal set up for you to do that with my physiotherapist. He taught the physiotherapist from Bedford who used to come over once, I think it was once a week, or twice a week, I don't remember, and they would talk their anatomy. So I, I, I kind of earned my apprenticeship teaching physiotherapists <laughs> anatomy before I could <laughs> progress up to teaching the medical students their anatomy. I say progress, but I mean, you know, it's, mm. it's, once you know it, you know it, there's nothing nothing intellectually challenging about it mm. at all. Do you obviously enjoy teaching, yeah, or you did enjoy teaching? Oh, I do, I do, I still do enjoy teaching. Which oh, kind, I particularly, teaching. I mean, lecturing, supervising, the Both, students? both. Um, I supervised right up, I mean, I, I, long after I've been a professor, I supervised for the whole of the second year medics as well as NST students here. But then the college appointed uh, a, a medic to uh, a fellowship, um, and he was a medic, and he, part of the fellowship meant that he had to teach, mm. and he was a neurologist, and so he taught the brain, which is what mm. I've been teaching. Mm. I was perfectly happy for him to do that. I can't, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the fellowship, it was one that was endowed, that begins with M. Uh, um, the mathematicians had it first. Mm. Anyway, I can't remember it now. Mm. But, but he, but he, he mm. took over. And you enjoy lecturing? Yeah, I do mm. enjoy lecturing. Mm. And uh, you must do quite a lot of PhD supervising? or Not now. Mm. Because uh, I have done PhD supervising. I never had more than two students mm. on the go at one time. So they were overlapping. As it was. was that I intentional? Yeah, or? it was intentional. students and I could feel if I could give them bearing in mind what I'd been through I I wanted to have a continuously open door mm. and give them uh, undivided attention mm. um, so uh, but this of course when you're due to retire mm. you can't take on mm. as, uh, students mm. so I haven't taken any on because this is officially my retirement mm. Uh, I haven't taken any for the last three years. Mm -hmm. Although I, I'm still carrying on with my research, I've still got grants. Yeah. And we'll be continuing um, till the end of next year, possibly longer, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm a, a joint holder of the Labour Union with, mm -hmm. uh, with Rob. Pat mm -hmm. and I are on one side, and Rob and Martha the other mm -hmm. side. So, um, so I'm still engaged and involved with that mm -hmm. to some extent. Again, yeah, which is very much a part of brain evolution, which mm. my interests. Let's, let's go back. I mean, you, you became a fellow of, was King's 
college that you became a fellow of? No, I didn't. I didn't get a because I'd not done my undergraduate degree here. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a fellowship, but I did teach. I taught for uh, I taught for Kings actually mm -hmm. um, in 73, 74, mm -hmm. 75. Uh, but then uh, Charlie was, I think, very much in favour. Charlie Oak. Yeah, mm -hmm. of, of having uh, uh, someone who had a medical qualification, mm -hmm. and the college appointed. Pharmacologist called, oh, I can't his name. but he went up to the to a chair up in in, in Edinburgh. Mm. Uh, you may remember him. He had a a, a, a limp. I can't, mm. remember, I can't remember his name. I'm getting terrible. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, so I didn't get a fellowship here. Mm. But you must have in the end. I mean, at what? Point? Yeah, I, I then I then went. I talked. I became what was called. Subdirector of Studies for uh, Medical Sciences at Sydney Sussex, and I taught Newman. Mm. Um, and uh, I t I, again, I pr I didn't teach topographical mm. in the set in you know upper limb, lower limb, that kind of mm. topographical. Mm. But I did teach head and neck endocrinology and uh, brain mm. and br both brain and neuroscience, both the anatomy and the physiology. Mm. Mm. Um, and then, uh, oh, they, they, they uh, after, after the pharmacologist, they appointed, um, um, what was his name from anatomy here, who also went to Edinburgh, um, Matt Kaufman. Mm. Do you remember that? Now he was appointed here as a college lecturer in anatomy, mm. um, but um, Matt didn't stay very long. I think he was only here for three years, and he, mm. he moved off to a chair of anatomy in Edinburgh. Um, and then I think by this stage, Charlie was a bit disenchanted with people who were not staying around very long, uh, and he asked me if I was still interested. So I mm. said yes, I was. And then I got so I think it was 19, uh, 1985 before I was appointed a fellow here mm. at King's. When, I mean, in the university job, were there any people who you particularly worked with or were influenced by? I mean, there are a lot of famous people on the edges of your field in Cambridge. Oh, there are. Like, I mean, Joe, Joe was an absolute Joe. Joe uh, Joe Herbert, who yeah. I moved to, mm. was the antithesis of Richard Michael. Mm. He was completely informal. He was totally disorganized, mm. but brilliant, mm. brilliant mind. And what Joe taught me to do was was really to think about things and think about them hard. He used to use the expression, "You have you have to think about it until it really hurts, and then you've got to think some more." <laughs> He, he was, uh, but he was good because he, he always acted as devil's advocate. Mm. So, so when we had all our lab meetings, and, and you had to be ready because you knew you were going to get it. Mm. And Joe didn't hold his punches at mm. all. I mean, it, 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 this this was gloves off intellectually, mm. Mm. but at a personal level, he was the most the warmest, kindest person you can imagine. But he was very rigorous, mm. intellectually rigorous, still is. Mm. Um, but. Uh, but yes, I learned a lot from him, and uh, I've also learned a huge amount from Gabriel, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Not that Gabriel is my is exactly my subject there, mm -hmm. but but G Gabriel is Gabriel, Gabriel Horn. Gabriel, is Gabriel Horn, yeah. Gabriel's what I call he's got real leadership qualities. He's he's absolutely brilliant at motivating people and encouraging people and. Uh, being very helpful when it's necessary to be helpful, but he he kind of when I moved to uh, when I'm I was asked to uh, if I would like to take over from Pat actually Pat was the um, uh, Pat Bateson Pat Bateson yeah mm -hmm. although I did over having said that going back I did overlap with Gabriel for a few years in anatomy because he was in anatomy when I was there mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
I mean, he, he was very, very affable and friendly and come and talk. Mm. He was the only person in the whole department apart from Joe because all of the, all of the medics, and I was the first non-medic ever appointed, mm. myself and Martin Johnson both appointed at the mm. same time, and all of the other medics kind of, well, I wouldn't say they sent us to Coventry, but mm. they, were, they were not warm and mm. welcoming. And they'd always have this, you know, you're not medically qualified type of attitude at the mm. back of their minds. Which, I mean, I'm prepared to say I knew my anatomy better than them because mm. at the end of it, because it's something you can know and know once you know it, that's mm. it. But you, you know, you can then, if you're a thinking person, you can elaborate mm. on things and put things together in a, in a different sort of way. But um, Gabriel wasn't like that at all. Gabriel was keen on anyone doing research, keen on, on things happening. And I, I was the first person to introduce uh, radioactivity into the anatomy department, which caused all sorts of problems, <laughs> and uh, for doing radio assays. And Gabriel came and said, hey, how do you do that? What do you know? And he was really, really uh, interested in what was mm. going on. He probably can't remember that now, but mm. I remember it very well, because he was very positive and very, he made, he made me feel important, you know, and, and nobody else in the department, apart from Joe, who was lovely, nobody else in the department ever spoke to me. Mm. Of course, Har Harrison had been very welcoming, mm. nevertheless, I mean, you know, he was busy doing his own things, he was head of department, and he was also, he was, he, he, I mean, he was, he, he was not nice whenever you saw him and helpful, but he, he kind of was a bit detached from the department. He had his own uh, things going at the zoo and things going at the Royal Society and what 